So today I'll actually be talking about this extremely beautiful and versatile technique called gravitational lensing. You know, gravitational lensing, uh, I mean, ha have, has any, everyone heard of gravitational lensing? Yes, okay. It's an extremely versatile uh, probe of various things which cannot be probed by almost any other means, okay? Gravitational lensing of gravitational waves, gravitational lensing leading to discovery of new exoplanets, gravitational lensing uh, of background galaxies, say uh, by JWST observing towards a galaxy cluster, you find the earliest galaxies in the universe. So, you know, it's an extremely versatile tool. Okay. And uh, it is based on the fact that light gets bent. It, you know, it does not travel on straight line, but it sort of is bent by Let's actually get started with this phenomenon. <clears throat> uh, so I have already drawn this figure. Uh, <clears throat> right. So uh, by the way, gravitational lensing, uh, when was the first gravitational lensing observation done? Do you guys know? That's, That's correct. correct. The 1919 solar eclipse, uh, led by Arthur Eddington was the first time that people measured uh, gravitational lensing. And so there's a factor of two discrepancy between the Newtonian result and the general relativistic re result. OK, and that observation was was consistent with the general relativistic result. And that's how it sort of. Uh, it's only after that that Einstein become, became as famous as he is now, right? So that's when people sort of started saying that, yeah, general relativity is the theory of uh, gravity. Okay. Um, so let me actually show you, before I do these things, let me actually show you a slide of, taken from actually that paper. Uh, this is, Okay, this is an actual figure from this paper, Dyson, Eddington, and uh, Davidson. And what it shows is distance from the center of this. So, so basically the idea is uh, you need an eclipse in order to be able to do this exercise because the sun is so bright, you cannot see the background stars normally. But during an eclipse, the sun's light is blocked by the moon and you can actually see the background stars, okay? The Earth is spinning, right? So the background stars, if there was no bending of light, you know exactly when the background star will go behind the sun, right? But if the light uh, bends because of the gravity of the sun, you will see the background star a little longer than what you would expect in absence of bending of light, right? You can actually see behind the geometrical shadow of the sun, because the light comes, uh, you know, it bends and comes towards you. So that sort of is the the qualitative idea now here. So the you know these people actually were observing this eclipse from Brazil and Africa. They didn't want like suppose one place is clouded, you don't want to lose that chance. So they they had this these two teams, and what happens is uh, this is the distance from the center of the sun. Now, this is closer and closer to the sun. This is farther from the sun, so distance increases to the, to the left. And this is deflection, right? So zero deflection means that you know, light, light is traveling straight. You, the, the background star will just go in the sun's and moon's shadow uh, when you expect it, right? So when the distance from the sun is small. Uh, um, when the distance of the background star from the sun is small, the deflection is larger. These are sort of their data points. OK. And I think this is the. Uh, I mean, I don't know the three lines, but this is 
I, I, I told you that there is a factor of two discrepancy between the GR result, which is given here. So alpha hat here is the deflection. Uh, def bending angle from straight line. Alpha ha hat is there. C here is the impact parameter. Basically, how far is the ray from the center of the sun? Uh, uh, you know, basically impact parameter. Okay. This is the bending angle. If you plug in the numbers for the sun, uh, and if you put the impact parameter of the solar radius, you cannot see inside the sun, of course. So this is the this is the maximum uh, deflection that you expect, 1.75 arc seconds. And this is the measured displacement. This is one arc second, 1.1 arc second, because you know this C is not exactly equal to our sun. You cannot see so much closer to the sun. So this is sort of the idea. And this factor of four is important uh, because uh, the Newtonian calculation, if you assume light to be test particles and assume they behave uh, like uh, Newtonian uh, gravity, and if the uh, potential is weak and you sort of take the deflection regime, you get 2 gm by c squared c. Okay. Yes. Hmm? Oh, it does not depend, right? If, if you're the test particle, the trajectory does not depend on what the mass of the test particle is, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, it's sort of in the weak deflection limit. Okay. Mm, okay, so let's go back to where we were. So we'll now do this uh, uh, calculation. So this is the geometry. So this is the observer, O, okay? Let's consider a point lens like this, like the sun, you know, a star, which is located at L. So you can join O and L through a straight line. You assume L to be a point mass, okay? So this is a straight line, you know, this, uh, right? So this, the, the plane perpendicular to this line OL, which contains the lens L, is called the lens plane, okay? The plane in which the source lies, the plane perpendicular at the distance of the source S uh, is called the source plane. Okay, So this is like a background star. In the case of Eddington's thing, this is the, the sun. This is a background star. Uh, this alpha hat is that deflection that I was mentioning about. So I will actually not derive this alpha hat. Uh, it's actually... Uh, I think your GR course may do it. And the Newtonian calculation is extremely easy. We will actually encounter it in different guys later on when we do collisions and scattering of stars, you know, collisions between stars, you know, uh, interactions, gravitational interactions between stars. Okay. So it's important to have these notations. These are standard. This angle beta is the angle between this this uh, axis and the, the true location of the source. Angle theta is the angular position of the image. You know, so the, if you extend this uh, line OP to S prime, that's the, the apparent position of your image. Okay, uh, so by geometry, uh, the other thing that's missing here is this angle, is called alpha. Okay, alpha and alpha hat are different. Alpha hat is that deflection. So let me just write that down here. So alpha hat for a point particle is uh, 4 gm by c squared c. This c is this distance, lp. Right? This is the impact parameter in the lens plane. And you can actually see this looks like uh, you know, 2 gm by c squared is the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole of mass m, right? So it, it has connection to that. Uh, okay, now let's get back to the geometry. From here, you know that, uh, assuming that, you know, we are looking at both the lenses and sources, not at cosmological distances, so that you can just add distances. Otherwise, you have to take uh, the fact into account that there are various kinds of distances. 
there are angular diameter distance and uh, luminosity distances. We are not getting into that. We are assuming things are nearby, so you can use Euclidean geometry. OK, OK, so. So beta equals theta minus alpha, right? So the angle beta equals uh, theta minus alpha and this angle alpha so this this distance s s prime is equal to so uh, as all angles are small right all angles alpha hat alpha theta beta are much less than one so we'll use small angle approximation so this s s prime is nothing but this distance ds ds is the distance uh, from the observer to the source plane okay so uh, ds ss prime is ds times alpha right and that's just i mean we are uh, these angles are exaggerated all these are very very close to um, zero and this is also equal to alpha hat times this distance l you know this distance uh, the distance between the lens plane and the source plane which is dds right commit this to memory if you work on lensing this figure is the most important figure and it appears in all you know all astronomy textbooks and papers follow this notation it's good to just you know commit this notation to your memory it will help you read the papers better okay so then alpha is nothing but alpha hat times dds by ds so s so stands for source dd is this distance from o to l dd so you can think of small d as dense you know the, the thing that is uh, causing gravity the mass that is causing gravitational lensing dense so sometimes people also use l for it uh, for lens but you know we'll be using dd okay so we have this equation beta equals theta so beta is the true angular location of the source right without if there was no deflection beta is the angle at which the source is located if there is deflection it is located at theta this angle and theta minus alpha is nothing but 4 gm by c squared c so that's just uh, alpha hat i have substituted for alpha hat the deflection uh, value and then we have d ds by ds okay the other thing that we want to note is that this c is nothing but c is nothing but dd times theta so i'll just replace c by uh, so i'll just put dd here and I'll put theta here. Got it? So uh, now this quantity, which I'm putting in a closed contour, is a dimensionless quantity, and that's theta e squared. Okay, and this is called theta e is called uh, Einstein angle. Okay angle of a lens right so if you have a gravitational lens system you know dds dd ds and you can actually calculate the einstein angle so this equation the lensing equation becomes beta equals theta minus theta e squ squared by theta e theta by theta okay and you can de-dimensionalize these angles uh, and just say your, you can actually call uh, beta by theta e as say x, so dimensionless uh, angle uh, of the true position of the source, and similarly theta by theta e as y. So you have x, uh, sorry, uh, this yeah x equals y minus one by y. Right, so X is the beta true location. Y is the is the location of the image. 
and you see this is a this will give you a quadratic so given an x find the value of y you are, you are getting a quadratic equation which is y squared minus xy minus 1 is equal to 0 and you can easily solve it uh, you get two solutions right uh, you get so all, y is nothing but theta so theta is equal to theta. so there are two solutions let's call them plus and minus theta plus minus is equal to uh, beta by 2 plus minus beta squared plus 4 theta e squared by 2 okay so basically what this tells us is that there will be two images formed actually in this case and these are the angular locations of the two images so let me actually schematically show what i mean it is in my slides uh, here you see here is your true location of the source this light bends like this and you know the apparent position looks like this one and the light this ray bends like this and the, there is the second position so these are the two roots okay now uh, actually this theta e is an important quantity uh, uh, theta e is an important quantity uh, because theta e sort of determines the uh, theta e determines the angle the you know the, the angle in the problem right theta e determines all the uh, sort of what, what will be the magnitude of the angles of deflections and so on. They are all proportional to theta e because that's the only dimensionless angle in this equation. So it's good to put in the plug in the numbers, typical numbers. This is actually an important equation. This is the point mass lens equation. This is of course the solution of this equation also important um, let's see <clears throat> so let's plug in the numbers so theta e i have actually already made the calculation so this is 0 0.9 milli arc seconds so milli arc seconds is 10 to the minus 3 arc seconds right what is the resolution of say jwst angular resolution it's it's actually you know not better than 0.1 arc second this is still smaller by two orders of magnitude okay so let me actually complete this expression and then i'll tell you what the significance of this is so if my lens is uh, a solar mass star and if it is at a distance of uh, 10 kpc the size of the galactic disk You see, I'm just, I'm just, uh, so this is actually a minus sign here. I'm just plugging in for theta e from this expression, right? So theta e should be square root, proportional to square root of m and inversely proportional to square root of dd, the distance of the lens. Okay, um, and then I have one minus dd by ds to the one half. So tip, yeah, so actually let me let me put this line to se segregate this formula. So this is the theta e. So what, what does it mean? What I'm asking is if I put a star uh, 10 kiloparsec away, and if I look at the lensing of a background uh, point source, uh, it will be lensed. Uh, and it's sort of deflection angle will be of order this much. So this means that you cannot resolve it with any telescope, essentially. Uh, so is this sort of useless? Like, you know, can you not observe lensing by stars? Actually, we'll come to this, uh, even though you cannot image the background source uh, because of this small angle, it will still have an observational implication because of something called magnification. Gravitational lensing not only deflects the background objects, it also 
changes the brightness, the apparent brightness of the flux of background sources. Okay, and that is, it turns out, will be observable. And actually, we'll see how. Uh, we are so okay. So we are putting DD at 10 kiloparsec away, not at the sol, no, not at one AU. If you plug one AU here, you will actually get very good question. 40 arc seconds. 40 arc second is resolvable. Very good question. Right. So if you put, uh, you know, for the for the for Eddington experiment, you know, for Eddington expedition, you know, for the sun, what you get is theta e is about 40. Arc second, which is very well resolvable. Similarly, if you plug in the numbers for Jupiter, Jupiter is about a thousand times less massive uh, than the Sun, and uh, it's like at 4 AU. So if you plug in the numbers, both factors will sort of reduce your theta e because m is small and dd is large. So this is about uh, you know 0 0.63 arc second. So, you know, but at the limit of resolving but the good thing about jupiter is you know do not need eclipses all the time you know it's not a bright object like the sun so this people have actually tried to do it and i think they have been able to do it okay jupiter is massive and it does not have its own light so it's sort of not as bad as sun okay so yeah th this is actually mathematically extremely simple right so quadratic equation these are the solutions you can uh, OK, um, the other thing is. Uh, so now. Uh, now we'll talk about uh, magnification. As I said, the background sources can be their flux can be magnified. Yes, yes. Because we have two, two values of uh, mm -hmm. theta plus and theta minus. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you see the object? You can actually see the object, two images of the object. Yes. Two or even more for a complicated mass distribution. Is this uh, an implication of, uh, say, uh, if it's directly behind it, forms a ring? That's uh, exactly. It, it is related to that. So we will actually come to that. Mm. Hmm. So, uh, so for example, you know, since Guru has already brought it up, so if if beta is zero, what is the solution of this equation? So if beta is equal to zero. That is, the source is exactly behind the line joining us and the lens. Then the solution is theta equals theta e. And in that case, the solutions are not on a line, right? You know, it, it is sort of the it has become much more symmetric than the previous situation. So the the two <laughs> points along the line joining the center of the lens plane becomes a ring. Because now all three uh, objects are in the in, in the same line. Okay, so this is this is this is uh, you know this will form this configuration will form Einstein ring. And actually, you do see these objects. Magnification. So as as I said, gravitational lensing can magnify. Uh, the images uh, and how does it do that? Um, so, so lensing is uh, if if you've done a little bit of your radiative transfer, right? So your specific intensity, which characterizes the radiation, the specific intensity is basically right. You know this I uh, this um, specific intensity. This is just energy crossing a surface a, a area da per unit time per unit uh, frequency <coughs> per unit solid angle right so specific and in intensity so if you have an area of an emitter or in, or any area and if radiation is crossing it in this particular solid angle and this is a n hat the not n hat like ds the area vector and this is the direction of the ray that you're considering. Uh, ah, sorry, DE by DA, DT, D nu, D omega. D omega is the small solid angle. OK, specific intensity. If you don't have emission 
or absorption or scattering specific intensity is conserved along a ray okay in gravitational lensing you are bending the light and so on but you are you don't have any emission or absorption so specific intensity uh, along a ray is conserved and specific in intensity is nothing but uh, you know the, right so so i mean you can actually put a cross theta here but let's ignore that so this theta is the angle between the area and the direction of the uh, direction of the ray that you're considering but let's just ignore and assume that theta is sort of zero you're considering rays which are perpendicular to the surface um, so what is uh, uh, right so this is fine uh, there is another another concept which is called surface brightness okay we'll actually come to this because for galaxy surface brightness is a very important concept surface brightness is nothing but flux flux is de by da dt right this portion this part is what we call flux right and if you sort of also split it in frequencies that you know that's also called flux but as a function of frequency but i knew is the most basic classical uh, description of radiation um, so surface brightness is flux per unit solid angle right and surface brightness like luminosity is an intrinsic property of an emitter right so if you put uh, an emitter far away its flux will reduce but it will also subtend a smaller solid angle by the same amount right because the solid angle goes like area divided by distance uh, squared and similarly the flux goes like one by distance squared so that distance dependence goes away so not only is specific intensity conserved the surface brightness is conserved and uh, so this is nothing but flux divided by what is solid angle solid angle is area of the source divided by distance square right this is solid angle now the, the flux goes like 1 over d squared and this d omega goes like 1 over d squared the d dependence the distance dependence goes away so surface brightness is an inherent property so if you have a bright object with a high surface brightness whatever distance you put its surface brightness is the same just like its luminosity luminosity is an intrinsic property but flux decreases solid angle decreases if you put it far away okay um so yes uh da is the area of the source yes yes exactly so you're you're assuming an extended source and small d is the distance of that source okay so the the flux is conserved and uh, no sorry surface brightness is conserved in in lensing surface brightness is conserved surface brightness is like a specific intensity and right? you know just you know ignore this d new part that's what it is so uh, surface brightness is pre preserved so that means flux is proportional to the angle solid angle so if if surface brightness is constant i mean the, the surface brightness of the image is the same as the true surface brightness of the source then uh, flux is proportional to the solid angle right so this is what we are so flux of the object divided by flux of the image is equal to solid angle of the object divided by solid angle of the image okay so let's we'll use this so so this is the line so i'm actually drawing uh, the lens plane uh, perpendicular to the line of sight okay so this is my lens let's say this is my true okay so let's see uh, let's make in some angle so actually this is my sort of extended source okay this is the true uh, location of the source now the every point in this source will get you know will be placed at a different location because of gravitational lensing so let's say this gets mapped onto this annulus okay 
So this is S, this is S prime. OK, and. And let's so this distance. Is like your theta, no, no, your beta. Right, the, the true position from the this axis was beta, if you recall, and this is the apparent position. Um, that's actually angle theta, OK? And what is solid angle? Solid angle is. So in the phi direction, they will have equal magnification. That's actually easy to see because they're all all points in phi direction here are like symmetric. It's only in the radial direction that it gets stretched or squeezed or whatever. So so delta phi this angle remains the same for. Uh, for the source and for the image. Now delta omega equals. Uh, so it's sort of area, right? So area divided by distance. So the area is proportional to. Uh, so so beat so beta times d beta. If this this width of this is small, you know, this is d beta. Small extent of the source. Similarly, this will be theta and this will be d theta. Right, so what I'm saying is magnification, which is the ratio of the flux of the image divided by flux, true flux, that's equal to the delta omega of the image divided by delta omega true, and that's, uh, so it's actually not equal to, it's proportional to, and that is actually equal to, this ratio will be equal to uh, <coughs> theta d theta by beta d beta. So, and actually magnification, we are taking a magnitude. So we'll just do this. It's always positive. So now we have the solution for the two images, theta plus theta minus, we can actually calculate this quantity, right? We know theta plus and theta minus. We can calcul calculate d theta d beta and you know calculate this magnification expression. It's just simple algebra. If we do that, we get m plus minus for the two images. We get uh, magnification as one by four absolute value of uh, beta by beta squared plus Four theta e squared. Um, plus. Beta squared plus four theta e squared. Divided by beta. Plus minus two. OK, so the, this is the magnification that you get for each of these images. OK, so let's see if it makes sense. Uh, so if we put our, I mean, if we put our uh, source too far away from theta e, you don't expect much magnification, right? You know, why should it magnify if it is not even close to the lens? So let's see what happens. What does this give you? If your, if your, uh, if your beta is much bigger than theta, e, that is. Uh, so this becomes one. This becomes one. So it will become two plus minus two by four, right? One. Uh, so it will give magnification of one and zero. This is what you expect. You see almost the same uh, flux of one of the images because then it's the same thing essentially. And the other thing, there is essentially no image. OK. Uh, what about when this Einstein ring thing, when theta is equal to, uh, when beta equal to zero? So when beta goes to zero, this term becomes zero, right? Now beta goes to zero, this blows up, right? It becomes uh, uh, twice theta e uh, by beta. So as you make, as you go closer and closer to the uh, line of sight, you get, you can get infinite magnification. If everything is a point and so on, you can actually get huge magnification. And that's why uh, it's so powerful. This case, so let me just write down 
when beta is much less than theta e, right? So, so your true true position of the source is inside Einstein angle. Then you have uh, these two magnifications are uh, theta e by two beta e. No, two beta. No, beta is not beta e. Okay, and uh, and so. I, Previously, I told you like the point sources like stars and so on, the theta e is actually tiny. You cannot resolve the two images, essentially. So what you can still see is the change in flux. OK, and what you will get is the, the net magnification will be the sum of magnification of all the images, right? So that would just be in this limit, it's Theta e divided by beta e. Theta e divided by beta. Why am I calling it beta e? Okay, so this we'll be using. Okay, so uh, any question? This is defined as the, uh, this is the source plane, and then this is the lens plane. This is the lens. Plane. This is the lens plane. So this, uh, you know, ba basically you can project it on both. It's basically we're talking about angles. So this is the angle. Uh, you know, th this is the angular position of the the source, and this is the angular position of the image, and their phi extent remains the same. And the observer is like out of the plane. Yes, so this is just a cut. Hmm. This is what it is. So we are looking at a cut in the uh, in the perpendicular direction. Yes. Oh, That's correct. That does not happen in reality. This is only for a point lens and a point source. If the source itself is extended, there is a limit on magnification. You cannot get very large magnification. Uh, so what I when I say it, you get infinite magnification, I'm using like a point source, which has uh, like a star, which is very high surface brightness. Right? For that, you can get huge magnification. But if you have a diffuse source like a galaxy, which is extended, you don't get it. Right, but uh, the point is, uh, surface brightness of the source is equal to the so surface brightness of the image. That's what I mentioned. Uh, it is a factor because if something is very low surface brightness, you cannot even observe it. You'll need a very long exposure time. But the it, limiting behavior is much less. If the source is a point source and if the lens is a point lens. So, you know, it, it makes it very like it's an idealized problem. In reality, you can actually get magnificent. Yeah, surface brightness. Like, the point, the Which DA? Surface brightness. Right. right. Yeah. Right. That's right. So for a point source, surface brightness is infinity. You know, by definition, it does not have an a area, and that's right. So that's correct. That's correct. Yes, exactly. And, and that's called a caustic. Uh, you know that sort of a that line is called the caustic. Okay. And uh, why this theta phi has to be right? So imagine a ring instead of a point, right? So the ring will be mapped to a ring, you know, by symmetry. So every sort, you know, it, it's a symmetry argument. If you have a phi symmetric distribution of mass, this is correct. In reality, if you have like a complicated thing, these angles need not even lie in the same plane. So you have to do like a, a vector, you know, uh, so treatment of these. Yes, very, you know, this phi symmetric uh, lens. OK. OK, so this is fine. So then now we'll come to something called so uh, micro lensing. So, you know, lensing by stars you cannot resolve in space, in angle, but you can still observe it in time. 
and this phenomenon is called microlensing. Uh, so microlensing was used in eight, late 80s and 90s to actually rule out uh, dark matter candidates within our Milky Way halo. So the idea is that uh, uh, you have a you have say our own Milky Way kind of a, a galaxy, and say you are observing background stars, say in large Magellanic clouds, uh, and you are monitoring the the flux of each star in the background field. By chance, if the background star and the foreground Milky Way halo dark object comes within theta e, it can actually suffer large magnification. Okay, and that will give rise to a temporal signature which you can hope to detect. So idea is this the idea is extremely simple. So you observe uh, you, you want to observe in an area where there is not a lot of mess, but still a lot of mass. So that is like look at Milky Way halo and look at a field with a lot of stars, right? A million or more stars. And if you're monitoring the light curves of all these million stars, by chance, like one out of these million or some number like that will be aligned within Einstein angle. And you will see this uh, magnification in brightness in flux, and that's called microlensing. OK, so I'll actually tell you how this works. Why is it called micro? Is it because of the mass range? No, ma mass range is like a solar mass. Uh, so there is also something Manish called was man, about yes. the EVH, uh, the that is correct. EVH. That's correct. And it's like femtol instant micro instant. He was, I think, okay with this. I think the crossing time, the light crossing time of the Schwarzschild radius, uh, like what, what is it? So for the sun, three kilometer by speed of light, is it micron? Three kilometer five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About the micron. So that's it. So that that is this. This this is the the this is why it's called micro lensing. The Schwarzschild radius divided by the speed of light, the time that it takes to, you know, cross the Schwarzschild radius is microsecond. So this is what uh, the geometry is. Let me draw. Again, I'm drawing. Uh, so this is say your lens, okay? And say you know you have some uh, background star. Yeah, and it just sort of randomly moves. And this is say theta e. This angle is theta e, right? Outside theta e, magnification is small, so it's not interesting. Only if this star goes within this theta e is when you will see, uh, you know, magnification of the light curve. And this is when it is the closest, right? This is when the so you know it's the relative motion which matters. So what I'm saying is let's put the lens at rest and let the uh, the background star cross it. it what, what matters is really the relative motion. So let's see. So, so this is where you will have maximum magnification, right? Let us see. So la, 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 la. and let let this let mu be the proper motion. That is uh, angle moved uh, per unit time. That's called proper motion. It's sort of moving on the sky. Uh, so <clears throat> this is so if it if the source is here, uh, this is beta. Okay, this distance straight line is beta, right? And beta here is larger, it becomes minimum here, and it's sort of moving in straight line, assuming that it just you know it's not deflected for that short time. So. Uh, so this is beta naught. The minimum value of beta is the, when it becomes perpendicular. And uh, this distance is mu t. Assuming that at t equal to 0, beta equals beta naught. That's where, where you choose your t equal to 0. So your beta, the angle, angular location of the source is equal to beta naught squared plus mu squared t squared. Right, so it's sort of simple geometry that you know beta naught squared plus mu squared t squared is b beta squared. So at t equal to zero, you are at beta naught. That's the impact. Uh, you know that's the 
true location of the source. Um, and recall this, I'll be using this formula, assuming that uh, beta is smaller than theta e. Uh, so my magnification is equal to uh, theta e divided by beta naught squared plus mu squared t squared. OK, now if you're monitoring a background source, what do you expect if something like this is going on? So at t equal to zero, you expect the maximum flux, right? And before it reaches the impact, you know, it's symmetric in minus t to t. So basically, if the point is here or here, it will have the same magnification. That is the same flux. So the background source is assumed to be a star with a fixed uh, flux. It does not vary in time. So what you expect is, so let me actually draw it like this. A curve like this. And this is uh, t equal to zero. So there is a very characteristic shape of this curve, right? So the stars are variable. You know, if you look at the stars uh, uh, flux in time, it has a lot of, you know, random looking uh, variations, but this is a very, very specific signature, right? And from looking at light, you know, light curves of a million stars, you can actually figure out whether something like this is happening. Okay, so this is, these were the micro lensing, uh, experiments that were done in 80s you know in 90s essentially so how many stars do you need to monitor so uh, so the cross section of a lens essentially is uh, pi times re squared where re is the einstein radius remember it's the geometric mean of Schwarzschild radius and this distance you know there was the square root of 4 gm by c squared a combination of distances uh, so that's uh, RE. Uh, so this is your uh, cross section for uh, micro lensing, uh, right? So you have to be within theta, within RE for micro lensing to happen. Uh, and suppose if you have n such objects, n such stars, or n such halo objects which will micro lens background stars then your total cross section becomes n times sigma right so that's like pi times number of number times re squared and re squared is is proportional to mass right so this is proportional to mass of an individual uh, individual uh, dark matter candidate for example so this becomes the total mass of uh, say dark matter. Let's say dark matter is what is doing micro lensing. So the cross section is proportional to total mass of the dark uh, of uh, uh, dark matter. It, you know, it does not matter whether you have a lot of small ones uh, or you have less number of big ones. The cross section is the same. The only thing is the time scale for observations have to be different, right? There is the time scale for this micro lensing, this, uh, uh, the time scale for this to go up and come back down, this time scale, let's call it T Einstein, that is like RE by the, this is the velocity of the background star, right? And <clears throat> if we plug in the numbers, so say Vs, uh, if we plug in to be, uh, say 200 kilometer per second. That's like a typical uh, velocity of a typical star in the Milky Way halo. That's just the depth of the potential well. Okay, and if we plug in RE value, you know, in that expression that we had, I don't think I defined RE, but RE is nothing but uh, RE is nothing but theta e uh, times dd, right? No, from this geometry, re is basically this c when theta is theta e. So r e squared is nothing but 4 gm by c squared 
d d d d s by d s uh, you can actually see this is the short shield this is twice of the short shield radius for a non rotating black hole and this is some distance factor uh, so if you plug in the distance to be 10 kpc if you plug in that distance d all of these to be of order 10 kpc and uh, uh, b to be this you get a te of order put in these numbers 10 to the 7 seconds oops 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 10 to the 7 seconds which is like you know three times 10 to the seven seconds is a year so it's sort of a month few month time scale for typical parameters okay so in order to such do such an experiment you need to observe the blank area in the sky which where you think there's a lot of dark matter and the background field where there are a lot of stars and you have to monitor the light curve of background stars uh, for at least few years Right, with the time scale of this rise and fall is uh, months. Now, how many how many stars do we need to monitor? So that's so so number of stars that we need to monitor is nothing but. Uh, uh, so how do we find out? So so we have the cross section for microlensing, which is this by all these stars in the halo, and uh, so we have to actually divide it by. Right, so this is not proportional. Let me just change this back to. Uh, yeah, it's proportional to so pi times R E squared. Uh, where R E I'm actually assuming that all the dark matter mass I, I'm using all the dark matter mass in this R E. So let me just call it total because I said whether you have very small a lot of small ones or a, a small number of big ones does not matter for cross section. <coughs> So this divided by uh, pi times, say you are monitoring a, a region of say 10 kpc squared. Right? This is the you know this ratio is the probability of uh, of your uh, background star falling within theta e of dark matter. If you plug in the numbers, it's about 10 to the minus five. So what it means is that the probability of a background star to lie within theta e of uh, this dark. So here what I've assumed is all the dark matter within Milky Way is uh, in 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 uh, equal mass sort of objects which we are able to we, we have we are observing it at that time scale. So, so your T e corresponds to some mass, right? If you have low mass, uh, uh, T e is smaller. So when you do that, you find this. 10 to the minus 5. So what it means is you have to observe a million uh, stars in order to say get 10 microlensing events. So that's why the so people did this exercise and you know built these surveys, calculated the time scale for these surveys, and you know figured out which field to look at. You, know, you have to have in the field at least a million stars which are not uh, obstructed by other mess. Okay. So. There were so there were these experiments called Ogle and Macho and so on, which tried to put constraints on dark. So the the game here is if so if you are observing a million stars and if you see uh, ten microlensing events means uh, you know your dark you know you have about the same number of events. Uh, that you expect, but if the number of events is much less, that means you are not seeing the the expected number of uh, microlensing events, right? So that's how they could put upper limits. You know, for example, uh, the dark matter being in the stellar mass range or a big range around the solar mass is ruled out because of such uh, experiments. Okay. Okay. So this is about microlensing. Yes, n is the number of. Uh, so then n is the number of uh, uh, these dark matter particles, or the machos, or the 
dim objects which have mass but no light. Sorry. So what I said is the total mass is what matters because cross section gets multiplied by n because if there are n n scatterers and each of them is proportional the area of each of them is proportional to m. So it's the total mass which matters, not whether you have so many uh, or so less. The, the total mass of dark matter. Uh, okay. Ruled out as what? Like the mass. You cannot have, for example, you cannot have all the dark matter in the Milky Way halo uh, composed of uh, of dark objects in a mass range of 10 to the minus 3 solar mass to you know tens of solar masses. For example, that kind of exercise has been done. OK, now. Uh, we'll quickly do so I did point mass, but if you have extended masses, extended masses like dark matter halos, right? In which the mass is not a point mass and you know it's sort of the density is an extended density. In that case, what you do is this alpha hat formula is actually just a simple generalization. This is just 4 G by C squared. And now what you have is the projected mass within your impact parameter Xi, right? And right, it's exactly, the, it's almost like the Newtonian result, right? If you have an extended mass, the, the gravitational acceleration is as if all that mass uh, is put at the center. It's almost like the same result, okay? And we'll not actually go into how you get it, but you know it's done in standard textbooks. And this is defined as uh, zero to xi uh, sigma r two pi r dr. Right? So sigma is the surface density. So if you have a, a mass, uh, a spherical mass distribution, sigma is just integrate that along the line of sight. That gives you mass per unit area. Rho. So this is nothing but integral rho dz, right? Along the line of sight, if you integrate it, that's just mass per unit area. Okay. So what what does our lensing formula become? It becomes theta equals beta minus uh, one by theta times dd. So this is nothing but C, remember. And uh, 4 G M less than C uh, by C squared times D D S by D S. It's all it's the same thing that I did previously. Just plugged in this formula. This is your expression. Right, so if if m is if the point mass is a point mass, this just becomes a constant value, right? And then this is just the previous formula that we had. Now, when you have an extended mass, uh, we can actually write this as beta uh, is equal to. Sorry. Sorry, this is uh, my mistake. I've actually written it wrong. This is this is beta equals theta minus this. Hmm. So then beta is equal to theta times one minus sigma xi by sigma crit you can actually write it like this and i'll show you i mean i'll motivate you see m by c squared is sort of like your sigma right m divided by c squared you multiply it by c squared that c squared gives you theta dd so it becomes theta square in the numerator so it comes out of this and you have an expression like sigma c which is uh, the surface density within your radius c and sigma crit is something called critical uh, uh, surface density. And if you just read it in, it, it should not depend on M, right? So sigma crit is nothing but uh, C squared by 4 pi G uh, DS by 
dd dds so this is your uh, sigma so this has dimensions of a mass per unit area right you can see if you put gm by c square that's one by length right? that dd cancels so dimensionally you can actually see that this is one by uh, this is uh, mass per unit area okay so what is the significance of this the significance of this is that if you have an extended mass you can still have still form einstein ring and strong lensing you can have st strong lensing of background objects even with an extended mass provided sigma c somewhere is greater than sigma crit sigma crit is like independent of i mean it just depends the distances and fundamental constants so if uh, sigma is greater than sigma crit uh, at some point sigma can become equal to sigma crit and that would correspond to beta equal to 0 and in that case theta will be equal to theta e so what it means is you can form uh, einstein ring ring for extended objects if they are dense enough if their uh, surface density is high enough uh, extended masses okay um if you plug in the number if you plug in the numbers for sigma crit you know these are all and if put your distance see when i have ds dd dds we put the same value for all of them i mean because we are not considering like very odd cases that the uh, the the lens is very near us or something if you put a dd of order a gigaparsec a, a cosmologically distant galaxy cluster for example then you get a sigma crit of about uh you know 2 times 10 to the 3 solar masses per parsec squared actually massive galaxy clusters very easily cross it this is not very high uh density surface density so that's why you can actually get strong lensing uh, and multiple images and einstein rings around galaxy clusters that's why galaxy clusters are such nice targets even for jwst one of the four five fields that were chosen by jwst one of them was a cluster field that's where you found the highest redshift galaxies and stuff because of this magnification okay so this is uh so we still have 5 minutes i uh <coughs> sigma is kind of the surface density this is the projected this is a projected distance mass. yeah yes so i have not done this in detail but this can actually there is a nice analogy between newtonian gravity expressions like you have poisson's equation similarly here like you know this fact that the you can put all the mass at the center for a symmetric distribution so there are a lot of these things and these are done in standard textbooks we don't have time to go into all that okay so let me actually there is okay so now let me actually quickly show you the images and stuff i mean real i mean that's why this course should have both uh, okay so this is the geometry that i showed you know these are the i mean this we already done commit this thing to your memory theta beta alpha alpha hat dds ds dd all these things are used in all gravitational lensing papers okay this is sort of the example of you have this true source and it gets magnified in angle it it subtends a larger solid angle uh, but surface brightness is the same so since its solid angle becomes large its flux becomes large that's why you see the light curve increasing um we have done this but for this in the theta e is the scale angular scale of the problem so theta e you know everything is proportional to theta e all angles are proportional to theta e so if your theta e is too tiny uh, and if your beta is bigger than theta e there is no lensing okay here is that example <coughs> of you have a point source here this is theta e so so this is you can think of it as an angle space <coughs> so they so these are the two images now your beta is much bigger than theta e 
and this is sort of the source. This is how it looks like. Yeah, lensing is achromatic. All wavelengths from radio to gamma rays will suffer from the same deflections because it's gravitational effect. Unlike a lot of other things which are very chromatic, depends on the frequency. Uh, so as I bring my so source true location closer and closer, you see the the second image becomes more and more uh, prominent, brighter. And when you're sort of approaching this theta e, you start forming this Einstein ring. And at at uh, uh, when the source is at theta e, that is now the actual source, the true location of the source is behind this point. It forms an Einstein ring. OK. This is an extended object, so it sort of shows that the inner parts get magnified more and things like that are taken care of. This is about that micro lensing thing. If you, you know, this 0.9 milli arc second I already mentioned, this time scale, like you know, I said, one third of a year. Um, anyway, so this is what you can plug in. This is the, the schematic that I actually drew. So this is the true location of the source which is going behind. OK, and these are the two images. So this is the highest beta, right? So this will correspond to this and you know this point. These will be the two images. For this one, uh, no, for where is the? Yeah, so this is the low, this is the beta value, which is smallest. For this case, you have this is one image and this is the other image. So you know this just shows what I talked about in a, in a, in a little better, more quantitative way. Again, this one shows the light curve. Now this, these are different P's. You know, these are different impact parameters. If my star crosses here, it won't undergo so much magnification. But if it goes here, like at 0.1, and you know, beta equals 0.1 theta e, then you'll have this large magnification. And if it goes through the center, it, in fact, it will have an infinite magnification. But the probability of that is small. Come on. Okay, here is a real light curve. Yeah, here is a real light curve from one of these observing projects which are looking at millions of stars. And you see this star suddenly brightens, suddenly meaning this is the time scale. This is in days. Uh, on a 20, 30 day time scale, it brightens and comes back. The light curve is very symmetric. That's the other characteristic of microlensing. And you, you can actually fit the model Right. The model is extremely simple. There is uh, only this velocity with which it is moving and this theta e are the only parameters. So in fact, this is how you detect planets. This is one of these uh, experiments which were looking at the background uh, light of, from these a lot of million stars. And you see this little blip here. So th this was beautiful micro lensing thing. And then suddenly there was a blip here. And this blip is sort of zoomed in here. And this blip is due to, so you have a foreground star and you're looking at the background stuff. That uh, foreground, uh, the background star slight increases and the foreground is not just a star. It also has a planet around it. And if the planet, if the background source crosses the theta E of the planet, you can get, you know, the, the little lensing, micro lensing on top of this signal. And that's what is seen here. Uh, so this is how you detect planets around uh, some of these stars. And the, right, remember the TE, the time scale for microlensing, is uh, is proportional to RE, and RE is proportional to square root of m. So the planet is a thousand times lower mass than the star, roughly. So square root of thousand is thirty. So Instead of a, uh, of a few months, it will be few days. You know, it will be much shorter signal and you know very symmetric, just like that. Okay. So these are some of the other examples. So this is a a double quasar. Okay. And if you look at very short exposure optical image, you do see this A and B. These are the two images of the same thing of the same quasar. Okay. So this is the case when Theta, the, the separation between images is resolvable. Unlike from stars, so this is uh, this is most likely because of a foreground cluster, which has a sigma greater than sigma critical, 
so it can form multiple images and give you Einstein rings and all that. So this is due to a foreground cluster. In this one, short exposure image, no. If you look, stare at it very long, you see this galaxy G1 popping up. So this is the foreground galaxy whose halo is lensing these uh, quasar. This is in radio, so this is an optical. This is a very large array, six centimeters, three centimeter, uh, and you do see this A and B. These are these A and B. You do see the radio core here. You see the jet and stuff, but here you don't, because the magnification depends on the angular position, and the angular position of the the extended stuff may not be favorable for. That's correct, but the fact that here there are two equal sort of brightness means that you are close to uh, theta e. Mm. I mean, you are, you are close theta. Theta is close to theta e, mm. or beta is close to zero. Mm. Uh, this is the same quasar, but if you use something called very long baseline interferometry, so instead of using a single radio array, you use radio telescopes spread out over the Earth just like this event horizon telescope is doing. It's sort of using a, a, a radio telescope spread out over the whole Earth to get super high resolution. So this now is this B and this A zoomed in very close. And you do see the now they are sort of appearing like twins. And this is the telltale sign that this is lensing. This is the spectrum of one of these quasars. So this is optical spectrum, and the spectrum is identical, achromatic. Lensing should just magnify it, should not change the color. So they are identical. They can be put on top of each other. OK. This is a galaxy. You know, This is a ground-based image. These are isophotes. We'll actually come to isophotes quickly, soon in the course. And if you look at the center, you see this cross. This is sometimes called Einstein's cross, because this is a background quasar lensed by the halo of this galaxy, and you can actually see one, two, three, four. This is HST image clean. This is again sort of four images of a background quasar, uh, and you know the if the mass distribution is extended and non-symmetric, the the lensing can actually be quite complicated. Right? There are people have written codes to do this. If you remove this thing, point sources, the four images of the quasars, what you get is like almost like a ring. This is the galaxy, the host galaxy of this quasar, perhaps, which is lensed uh, because of a foreground cluster. These are again galaxy cluster, galaxies at the centers of galaxy clusters. And you see these beautiful almost Einstein rings. So as I said, you know, this is a very versatile technique. This, so I, I actually really love it, although I don't work on it. Uh, but it's really, really uh, almost like a magic. You know, it's like nature's telescope. OK, go find the highest redshift galaxies. So this is another thing. So this is a background uh, galaxy which had a supernova go off and there is a foreground cluster. So the supernova is like a time event. So you see this. So you, it forms multiple images, right? So this is the background galaxy. Supernova goes off. And you know the, the light can take different paths, and uh, these different paths have slightly different time delays. The light from this event will reach Earth at different times. So you will see the supernova go off here in this system. You saw it in 1995, and you predict it to be 2015 to 2020. And in fact, you say that oh, it, something like this also happened in 1964. So this is like temporal signature of lensing. Not only that, there is like a, a supernova. There is like a, a tick in time which you're observing. If it was like a steady galaxy, you won't see this temporal. Uh, is this because of the light path? Yes, the different paths of the light take, you know, causes different travel times. And using this, actually, you can find the Hubble parameter, H0, because that sort of the, the time is proportional to the distance, which depends on the Hubble parameter. So it's actually extremely versatile. Even in the years. No, no, no. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. So the, the time lag can be this. Yeah, these are cosmological, so that that is possible. So delta T by T is still very small. Mass difference is about 15 light years or 13 light years. 
Yeah, yeah. Now this is a single star which was magnified by a foreground galaxy cluster. This is called year and L. This is at redshift of six. So you are able to image a single star at redshift of six because it, it happened to lie on this surface called the caustic, which is sort of equivalent of uh, like, you know, equivalent of that point just behind the source for an extended object. So if you are just behind the caustic and if you are a point source, you can get infinite magnification. This has a magnification of like 50,000. Huge. So that's why you can, you can actually see it. So this is another example. Here, this is where Nirupam, our own uh, uh, IAC faculty, uh, detected uh, the farthest H1, 21 centimeter emitting galaxy because of magnification due to foreground cluster. So, you know, it's the, the applications of microlensing are almost endless. I mean, I have not talked about all of them. You know, gravitational waves themselves get lensed and so on. So with that, I'm actually going to end the class.